welcome back to the Cover 3 Podcast here on CBS Sports. That's Tom Fernelli. That's Danny Cannell. I'm Chip Patterson coming to you live as we do every single Monday, 3 p.m. Eastern Time, youtube.com slash cover3. And hey, maybe uh, you're having an issue with your clocks. Maybe you haven't set them. Well, you would know if you smash that notification bell. So once again, subscribe at youtube.com slash cover3. Smash the notification bell. You get an alert anytime we go live, anytime that there's a new video posted. Uh, we will also be coming to you with instant reactions on Tuesday night to the new college football playoff rankings. Thursday for our locks. Uh, don't forget our Wednesday mailbag episode. Uh, that's more of an on-demand product. And all of you who have been riding with us uh, with the audio product for so long, uh, we thank you. And uh, please leave us a five-star review and a question within that review if you want to add a topic to the big old bag of mail. We will be hitting uh, some of those questions along with some other topics on Wednesday's show. Gentlemen, we have so much to get to. And it's a really uh, fun talking day in college football because there's some serious stuff, then there's some less serious stuff. There are significant movements on the coaching carousel and, and lots of dominoes that could fall from it. And, and it's all bundled together. It's, it's perfect. So the debate was already going in the live chat. Like, oh my goodness, are, you know, are we going to be talking about Texas Tech has a new head coach? You know, are we going to be talking about Jimmy Lake suspended uh, for the Arizona State game because of an altercation with a player on the sideline? But I, guys, I just can't over, get over the fact that Anthony Richardson was not able to play in an SEC football game in which his team was unable to score more than 14 points because, though he had been cleared by concussion protocol, um, he was dancing in the team hotel room and injured his knee as if things couldn't get any crazier for Dan Mullen and Florida. And this season that has left the Gators at five and four, your super talented offensive weapon, uh, unable to go against South Carolina. I don't know if it would have made a difference. The big headline also in Gainesville, Todd Grantham, uh, defensive coordinator out. We've also got a changeover at the offensive line position. I mean, does, do you want the LOLs? Do you want the, has Dan Mullen cooled his seat? There's just so much to pick apart here uh, with everything that's going on around the Gators. Like, have you ever injured yourself dancing before, though? Yes. Really? Yeah. Oh, I, it's, um, <laughs> is it your PCL is like in the back, right? And it's like not as dominant. Uh, there's the LCL, there's the MCL. I'm not sure exactly where the PCL is. I just know that I've it's never injured myself dancing. Of course, maybe that's where being like a bad dancer comes in handy. Like I'm not good enough to injure myself while doing it. Chapel Hill players. If you've been there before, like, you know that it's just, a, it's a live dance floor with very high standards. Like don't step on the <laughs> dance floor at players unless you're willing to take some risks. And I paid the punishment with that, with a, a little bit of a knee injury, you know? So thank you to uh, student health services for guiding me through that rehabilitation process. <laughs> Well, in our Friday night pregame, part of the ritual was a dance-off. Uh, I say that jokingly. That was not part of our uh, pregame <laughs> ritual that took place. Uh, I think this is one of those ones that's kind of low-hanging fruit, right? Like, like, let's make fun of the Gators now. I mean, kids are kids. I think people would be surprised at what type of stuff goes on. I bet it's gotten more physical when they're gaming, like playing Xbox or something like that, and they start getting mad and heated. There have probably been some injuries that way. I will have to ask my dad, who's a knee specialist, how many patients he's seen that have hurt their knees from dancing. I don't know how many that'll be, but I would guess the percentage is pretty low. Maybe it's different numbers around Chapel Hill uh, where they get a little wilder. Um so that's the LOLs. You guys have any more LOLs on Florida or do we get to the serious stuff? Because I do have a take on Florida. Okay, let's go, go ahead and take it there because we've got a lot to get to. So we don't need to linger too long. All right, so I think Florida has a culture problem. And mm -hmm. I noticed this kind of last year and maybe it was because Dan Mullen was feeling cocky, right? He was feeling good about the way the season unfolded, felt he had built up enough cachet with the program. But when Marco Wilson throws the shoe, and he doesn't really get on him, doesn't really make that big of a deal of it, kind of shrugs it off like, eh, it's not on me. Like, oh, well. Then, you know, after the SEC championship game, admits, oh, our season, or, excuse me, didn't say it then, said it after they lost Oklahoma, uh, Oklahoma and got waxed, admitted, oh, that was an exhibition game. That was essentially a scrimmage. Our season ended after the SEC championship game. When you repeatedly come out and you make excuses like this that sound an awful like excuses, 
and you send a message around your team that it's okay to approach the season as an exhibition after you're out of your championship goal aspirations, what do you think is going to happen the next time you're done with your championship goal aspirations and those are gone, which is what happened when you encourage your, your next loss to Georgia? To me, it sure feels like a lot of those players hung up on the coach too. And they were like, hey, this is kind of normal for us. We're not going to be SEC champs. What do we have to play for? And I know they had the issues with the flu. And I hate that this is the two teams that I have to compare. Could you say, well, this is a homer. If you watch the two teams, which had very similar flu-like issues, I'm talking players in the double digits of numbers, quarterbacks both who had quarterback issues and out of the game, missing both Anthony Richardson and then guess who else was missing in Tallahassee for Florida State. And you watch the two teams compete, just compete with all those excuses built in. To me, that's why I am still bullish on Mike Norvell at Florida State because I think the team is still fighting for him. I think that's the bigger issue is that I think you look like you you found a team that looked like it was okay to quit, and we've seen this a couple times now. So I don't know. I, I think there's a culture problem, and it sure feels like the you know the head on the stick has been served to the Gator gods. Like, here it is. Here's Grantham, and why not throw in our offensive line coach for good measure? I don't think that fixes the culture problem that Gainesville has. I think that's something that Dan Mullen has to address. I don't think it's a theory that can be ruled out based on what we've seen. I mean, it's it's a team that I it's it's hard to say at times because you know, like you think back to the Alabama game and it's like they played really hard in that game and they nearly won, but they lost it. And ever since then, things have kind of snowballed in the wrong direction and it could be going to exactly what you said where they felt like they've got nothing really left to play for and then they get to that georgia game and they get just waxed but like well not waxed but there was that stretch at the very end of the first half it was like you could it you could see the air go out of them when everything just went wrong and then the game was over and they knew they had no shot to win and then there's the emotional letdown coming into the game against South Carolina there's the flu there's the distraction of Dan Mullen being in the headlights for all the wrong reasons all week long because of what he was saying about recruiting and all that kind of stuff and it's just i don't disagree i i don't that struck me as a team that just did not seem to give a damn on Saturday against South Carolina and <laughs> I maybe maybe your quarterback hurting his knee dancing in the hotel for played a part in that too where it's like when you're looking around it's like my god what else can go wrong for us this season What's yeah that the was point? the the only comedy was that it was the uh, our pets heads are falling off yeah you know like it was just like and this too I cannot believe it uh I made two mistakes there it was just kind of flying off the top of my head excuse me Florida's four and five not five and four I gave you an extra win that you didn't have uh Gators out there and they did hit 14 points they got to 17 points against South Carolina had that score just a, a field goal off as well but as I pull up the schedule to to make sure I get all this correct coming down the stretch we we're playing at Sanford or playing against Sanford this Saturday at Missouri for the final SEC game the Florida State game is in Gainesville this is a four and five football team what is the final record of the Florida Gators at the end of the season in three games where the Gators will be a betting favorite in all three Samford, Florida State, and who was the third? Missouri in Columbia. Ooh. Seven and five. That, so three wins, just because the quality of what you've got on the schedule suggests that you can finish. Because a team that has quit is going to lose at least one of those games. That's where I'm at right now. A team that is like this seems to me like an uninspired six and six finish. Well, what's the next? Is the next game a zoo or Samford? Samford. So they should win that one okay, no matter so what. At, well, see, and here's the here's why here's why you do fire coaches. This will get their attention. I mean, look at what happened to TCU. Like, how else do you explain that than the team and and a healthy dose of Chandler Morris or uh, you know coming in to quarterback? Um, but you woke up your team, right? I mean, you, this is kind of the wake up call where they're like, oh, the things just got real. So I do feel like that you have a rivalry game. So I don't think you'll get a you know a half ass effort versus Florida State. I think Florida State will be much more competitive than we thought, but I don't trust Florida State to go ahead and say they picked that one. So yeah, I'm, I lean with Tom. Like I think they'll win out. But yeah, I, I feel when I think of those Columbia, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but when I look at those three games, I feel like really the only bad. one there. So with South Carolina, like... maybe they don't. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
I feel like the only one of those three games they're really capable of losing, though, oddly enough, is that Florida State game just because of the rivalry aspect to it. Like, Samford, they're not going to lose. Missouri's defense is just so bad that I feel like Florida can show up and half-ass their way to 30 points in that one. So I, I don't know. Um, a little bit of breaking news before we get to the suspension of Jimmy Lake for the Arizona State game while we're still here talking about coaches. Um, the is this now a Scott Frost retained emergency podcast? I mean, was is that a stunner that uh, Scott Frost is going to continue being the head coach of the Cornhuskers? Because, of course, with the defeat uh, to the Buckeyes, a narrow defeat at home, that's seven losses. Nebraska will not be bowling uh, under Scott Frost. Scott Frost has yet to uh, get Nebraska to the postseason. Not any big surprise as Nebraska makes that official? No. I mean... I think, honestly, I have to think that part of this decision is based on the other jobs that are open. Like, if you're Nebraska right now and USC is open, LSU is open, there's a chance. We can't rule out Florida coming open at some point, depending on how the next few weeks go. If Depending on what James Franklin does, Penn State could come open. Like, where are you on the pecking order of available jobs? And who are you going to get to come in? And there's also the aspect that, like, we've talked about it a lot, too. Nebraska's three and seven. But it's better than three and seven suggests. It's just the problem with getting caught in that line of thinking is four and six is better than three and seven and five and five is better than three and seven is. And does that necessarily where Nebraska wants to be? Because my problems with what I see with Nebraska right now is the problems that I saw on Saturday against Ohio State were the same problems I've seen in every Nebraska game I've watched for seemingly the last five, six, seven, eight, however many years since they got rid of Bo Pelini. It's just, it's a team that gets in its own way time and time again, and it makes mistakes. And there's always one part of the team playing well, and then it, everything else is playing poorly or doing stupid stuff, or there's just one or two really dumb or bad decisions, whether by player or coach, that kill them in the end. And I haven't seen any signs of what has happened in this current tenure with Scott Frost and his coaching staff other than the defense improvement that give me reasons to think, oh, well, next year they'll be fine. Next year they're going to get to eight, nine wins. They're going to be competing for the Big Ten West. It's like next year you're going to go in and your goal is going to be we're going to get to a bowl game. So if you go six and six, are you keeping Scott Frost next year and extending him again? Great question. I will say this, though. And it comes to very similar to what we were just talking about, Dan Mullen. I don't like when the records are why you fire a coach. Because then you find yourself going through this cycle of firing coaches every single year. And every time you do it, you set yourself back. And as we've seen, I mean, I don't know if uh, you guys, I'm sure, have heard the stat on first-round quarterbacks that have been drafted. And it's like 50-50, whether they hit or whether they don't. And it's hard to judge, like, what's a success or what's there's not. But when 50% of them are not on the team that drafted them within three or four years, I'd say that's a sign of not very successful. I bet, like, does it? do you guys feel like it's probably around 50-50 at any of these coaches are success stories at their schools? So basically, like, you're going to send Scott Frost packing for another <laughs> coin flip? Like, and it may work, but it may be maybe exactly what you're getting. And when you do, you're completely starting over. And again, don't look at the don't look at the records. Look at the culture. Like, see what is happening, and see if your team is competitive. Are they responding to the coach? Are they showing up and fighting every single week? And I think it's pretty clear that answer is yes. Like Nebraska is clawing away. It, there have been some coaching decisions that you could argue, and I know Bud was calling out some of them in the game. Like, hey, why didn't he kick the field, or why did he kick the field goal there? Why not go for it? You're down, you know, it's it's Ohio State. You want to win this game, and their kicker's atrocious. I mean, there's some of it is that, but I do feel like they're a solid culture that is close. And if they could, like, and I know it's hard to say this, but, like, that, that loss to Illinois set them on a path. It was like, ugh, if they win that game, which they very well could have, they didn't, you wonder if they could guild that, get that. And I feel this with Florida State. Like, Florida State has been competitive. They're not getting the wins. But if, if they would have gotten the win against Notre Dame, imagine how different the complexion of this program would be. And maybe that the win total is completely flipped. Like, maybe that's all it takes. But I think Tom brings up an excellent question. Like, you reset. Let's go six and six. That was the goal this year. And if you do it next year, is that a huge success story? Is that just mean you're a, a year later getting there? But at least you see progress. You can build on it. And they need they need to recruit. I mean, everybody does. That's the difference. We put so much emphasis on coaching. Who's our guy? 
it is recruiting. It is about the lack of talent that Nebraska has. When they're playing Ohio State, it is not even close. When they're playing against Michigan, it is not even close. So I think you could say, you know what? That's actually pretty impressive that he was actually go toe-to-toe with each one of them come up just short. Uh, see, well, there's another well, side to that argument, though. And while I agree with you, it shouldn't just be about record. If we look at Scott Frost since he came to Nebraska since 2018, and we look at how he's done in his own division, and we take out Iowa and Wisconsin, and we say, you know what, it's not fair to compare Nebraska to those two programs right now. If we just look at Nebraska against Purdue, Northwestern, Minnesota, and Illinois, the programs who you would think the, the floor for Nebraska should be we're better than those four teams. They're 6-10 and 10 against those four teams in Scott Frost's four years. Mm. He can't even beat the teams he's supposed to be beating. So at some point, not getting blown out by the teams he's not supposed to beat kind of loses its effectiveness when you can't even beat the Purdue's, Illinois, Northwesterns, and Minnesotas of the world. I would also tell Scott Frost uh, to pick up the phone and call Tom Herman and see how Tom Herman's vote of confidence went as soon as Texas found out it could get Steve Sarkeesian. And as the dominoes start to fall in December or maybe even into January, that a vote of confidence on November 8th could very, very quickly start moving in the other direction uh, if Nebraska does decide that it wants to make a change. Like they can... They can find some some motivation if, uh, if if they want to be able to take this in the other direction. But again, as we're sitting here recording uh, live on youtube.com slash cover three, wanted to give it a mention. But um, I don't I don't think the timing is coincidental because they are on a bye and their last two games are Wisconsin and Iowa. So there's a very good chance they're going to lose both those games. They're going to finish three and nine. And I think Trev Alberts, the AD there, just wants to Get it out now so people don't spend the next two weeks talking about it and then the two weeks after that when they likely lose those games. If he's smart, though, this has nothing to do with people criticism, fan criticism. It's all about recruiting. Mm -hmm. Like That's where he should be saying publicly, and that's where I wonder if this is. But this is all about, hey, we can't. We got to make sure recruiting is locked up because that's the issue. We've talked about this a lot on here. If you make a change, it's probably going to be really close You know, late in the game. You're going to have two weeks to put together a draft class. I think this is more about all right, we want Scott. We're probably going to do this. Like, not as much guarantee as we've learned. In order to make it work, we need to make sure that we have our recruits tied up and we can put our best foot forward toward a rebuild of this program. Joey McGuire introduced as the next head coach of Texas Tech. Uh, Joey McGuire's name is so familiar because he was one of the key assistants retained from Matt Rule's staff when Dave Aranda came to take over. He was, in fact, a candidate for the job and uh, has been uh, you know, targeted, acknowledged, and complimented for his ability on the recruiting trail and sort of what he's done from the, the personnel standpoint within that Baylor program. Big-time Texas high school ties. It, Texas Tech makes this move, and it's interesting because it comes with something that I don't think is unprecedented, but certainly within a conference stands out as unique. Joey McGuire is leaving Dave Aranda's staff right now. He is going to go begin working on recruiting and start working for Texas Tech and, and continuing to, to push that program forward. He will not be the head coach immediately. They will continue um, with their interim in place. But also, Baylor and Texas Tech play each other here in the next couple weeks. So that's something to keep an eye on. Baylor plays against Oklahoma this Saturday, one of the big games in the Big 12. What do we make of the McGuire hire? Um is the timing something that we're going to see more of with coaches just, you know, up and leaving? Like Clay Helton was available. So him joining Georgia Southern saying he's going to get involved in recruiting and the team building process, that that wasn't as dramatic. But this is a loss for Dave Aranda's staff here in November. And uh, what seems to be a sensible um thumbs up high again the thumbs up thumbs down binary ones and zeros. You tell me Joey McGuire got hired at Texas Tech, and I give you a thumbs up. I mean, I, I think we, we've talked about this, like, I think last week or the week before. We're going to start seeing this become the norm with the early signing period. Although I think the difference is, like you said, we saw Clay Helton, Georgia Southern hired in season. He was out of a job. We're seeing Joey McGuire leave Baylor to go to Texas Tech, but he's an assistant. We have not crossed the Rubicon of a sitting head coach leaving their current job to go to a new school yet. It'll be interesting to see when, and I don't say if, when that happens, because I do think it's going to happen eventually. As for McGuire, I mean, I can't sit here and tell you that I know everything about McGuire's background. I What I do know is that he's a well-known name in Texas. And as you mentioned, he was on Matt Rule's staff at Baylor. 
He's a coveted member of that staff because he's a longtime high school coach in the state of Texas. He's very well respected among the high school coaches in that state. And we all know what high school football and how important that is in the state of Texas. So I think for a place like Texas Tech, you know, you went, you got Matt Wells, the last job. He's a coach I liked. I thought it was a good hire. Didn't work. Like Danny said earlier on the show, flip the coin. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. But I think that if you are Texas Tech, which is a really difficult job, and I think Mike Leach kind of did so well there that it kind of glossed over how difficult it has been to win there over the history of the program. I think this is a smart kind of hire where you've got somebody who might not have credibility nationally as a college football coach, but within that state and within those high schools where you're going to have to go in and you're going to have to find those hidden gems that aren't going to Texas or Oklahoma or TCU or even, you know, Baylor and Houston at this point in the new big 12, you've got a guy who's got credibility right away, who can get his foot in the door to help bring more players to Texas tech and raise the floor of that program. So I think that based on what I know and just the coin flip nature of it, I think this is a good direction and it's a good process. What the results will be no idea. I'll give it a grade. I give it a C plus. And you know what I'm going to give every coaching hire from here on out? <laughs> a C plus. Because I have no idea what it's going to be. You know what it's probably going to be? You know what it's probably going to be? It's probably going to be seven or eight wins. Like maybe six, seven or eight wins. Because guess what? That's what Texas Tech has been throughout the entire course of its history. Except for Mike Leach, who is the, he's the outlier. Mm -hmm. Everybody, Spike Dykes is a legend. At Texas Tech. They, I mean, whatever happened to Sonny Dykes, by the way, I'd be love to know if he said no or that wasn't the guy. But he's they were he was the guy because his dad did such a great job. Have you looked at Spike Dykes' record as the coach? Is it five Texas Tech? Like nine wins was his best year, and it was a whole lot of seven and six. Like that's what you are. Now, here's where you possibly could get lucky, and this looks like a great hire. Maybe that seven and eight wins becomes nine and ten because guess who's leaving the Big 12? So you're going to swap out Oklahoma and Texas all of a sudden for Houston, Cincinnati, BYU. Like you should be able to, maybe, maybe you'll be more competitive now in a revamped Big 12. The whole high school thing boggles my mind. I mean, I grew up in Florida and I'm very familiar with the, and I know that it's a cult and it's a religion and it is different in the state of Texas with high school football coaches. But man, who is like, I want to know, like, what's the ring you have to kiss? Like, who, what high school coach do you have to go, like, meet with? And what, like, are there five of them? And you meet with the different families? Because it feels like a mafia. That's what it feels like to me. And you have to have them all aligned and on your side. But really, it makes that much difference where you're hiring a coach based on his high school career. And I, maybe that is. Maybe it's something I am completely unfamiliar with it. And I get you have to play the game. I just are, is that going to be the difference in you swaying players from going to Texas A&M or Texas or even TCU, which are all better options for a high school player because you have a good relationship with the high school coach? He's going to say, "Hey, hey, Bobby, like you don't want to go to Texas or Texas A&M. You got to go to Texas Tech because that Joey McGuire, he's my guy. Like that's not how it works. Like that's where I have no idea why this priority of the high school coaches takes such precedence there." And it doesn't in Florida. Like it does in every state. Like I just don't know why it's such a big deal in, in Texas. I don't I don't think it works for like the five star and the four star guys. Like obviously having the connection if there's a talented player with that kid's high school coach will help get your foot in the door, but it's probably not going to push him to your school. But I think where it helps is for when you're looking at the pool where Texas Tech's most likely to be recruiting, whether that's like the three star guys or maybe the dudes flying under the radar, that's where having the connections will come in handy. And I mean it worked well for Baylor with Art Bryles until obviously it didn't. And I think that Texas Tech kind of trying to find that same kind of result that Baylor had that kind of set them up for where they are now. And you like know what helped Art Bryles? You know what helped Art Bryles? They looked a lot, of, they looked the other way on a lot of academic issues, character issues, and a lot of other things. And look where it got them. Like that's it, like I don't think it had to do maybe it had like the coaches that called him, the high school coaches are like, hey. Those schools can't touch this kid, but you can. Like, it's like, let's just be real point. about this yep. whole thing. Like, that's how it unfolded. I just, it boggles my mind why we get to this place of, oh, these, these and I do agree, but guess what happens when you get like good three stars? You're going to be seven, eight win team. 
Like, good. Like, that's what, but that's I, I like fans will take. I think a Texas Tech now, fan is absolutely going to sign right. up for somebody who will consistently deliver a bowl team that is going to be competitive against the best teams in the conference. Didn't that, Tuberville give that? Yeah, maybe not. Until that one dinner when he didn't it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Sailed. <laughs> um, okay, one more coaching note here. Um, and apologies to Walt. But actually, I'm going to start saying apologies to Walt Bell. We didn't have time for you for like the rest of the season. <laughs> um, apologies to Walt Bell, who is out at UMass. But Jimmy Lake is going to be suspended for the Arizona State game uh, as a result of the, uh, the sideline kerfuffle uh, with a player. The incident itself, did we kind of mention it on the reaction pod? I we can't just, remember if it was on the pod or if it was us talking about it after the pod. Okay, but I, the incident itself didn't, I don't have any strong takes on it. It just, it didn't really um, raise to the level of outrage or big time reaction. I do think the results from Washington on the field provide enough evidence for Washington's administration to start you know, considering whether Jimmy Lake has this thing going in the right direction and Jimmy Lake, much like Dan Mullen with a little bit of pressure on him, uh, has made a move and fired offensive coordinator, John Donovan. But I also um, know that coaches, when they start getting suspended and in trouble with their bosses, the path is not often all the way back to, and he turned it around and led us to conference championships. Like oftentimes, even if it's something small, that can be the first step down the line. There is one exception that comes to mind and shouts to the Ion College Basketball Podcast, Gary Parrish, Matt Norlander. They made this joke, so it's on the top of mind this week. Basketball starts this week, so go and listen to them if you're into college hoops. But, uh, like, Jimmy Lake's name isn't Will Wade, and, uh, and Will Wade is the only coach I know to bounce back from a suspension and just be able to keep it moving. So uh, what do we think about Jimmy Lake the, the suspension for Arizona State, where this might be headed, and how you would forecast it, uh, given everything we know around this Huskies program. I think it's hilarious that we mentioned John Donovan's Donovan name. Donovan shows up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, like, I'm in meetings, man. Like I, you know, I'm trying to take care of business. I'm doing boss stuff here. And then all of a sudden, it's like, oh, is it time to talk about the, Don, the John Donovan firing? Hold on, hold my calls. Beep. <laughs> um. As for the Jimmy Lake suspension, I won't go too deep in on it. I will just say, all right, sure. I mean, Danny, you played a lot of football in your life. Have you never seen a coach get mad at a player on the sideline before? No, I, that, that one bothers me because this one feels like <laughs> – I don't want to use any buzzwords. I just don't want to oh, set people yeah. off. But it feels like this is all based on the reaction of people on Twitter that don't really yeah. matter. And there's mm -hmm. outrage, so we have to respond to it. That happens – all the time and yep. i'm okay with it and so if anybody's like oh well, if that happened to my son if that happened to my daughters from their soccer coach i would be okay with it especially if it was in response to something they did that was really stupid and hurt their team I'd be like yeah you know what i uh, it was it was just not an infraction that should have incurred a one game suspension i'll say that i think yeah I, if if jimmy lake is winning more games and there's not a possibility that this could be used as a way to get out of a buyout or anything down the road. I don't think Jimmy Lake is suspended without pay for a game because of what happened. I think that's just something so that if happens. His name, if, if Jimbo, if he, didn't Jimbo grab the Jimbo's player? Done it. Well, I was, I was going to go a different sport and say, well, if his name was Tom Izzo and it was the NCAA tournament and he goes after a kid aggressively, but then guess what Tom Izzo had? Draymond Green and mm -hmm. you know a hundred other former players saying, no, 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 no. We have a relationship where you we trust our coach. We know what he's doing. We can deal with that type of coaching. We want that type of coaching. Most players say we want that type of coaching, but he's not. He doesn't have the run of success that Tom Izzo had. He didn't have a national championship like Jimbo Fisher had when he's grabbing Jameis Winston by the face mask or other players. So what are we doing? We're sitting here with a suspension. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and sorry for being late. Uh, I. I did have some meetings, but I also uh, totally misread my calendar. So I was thinking 3.30. <clears throat> but I would not have scheduled a meeting for 3 o'clock if, uh, if I'd known. Or could read a calendar. Anyway, I am much more concerned by the hiring of John Donovan uh, than <laughs> of, of this slap or push or whatever. It's football, right? Like, And I think Tom nailed it. It is being amplified by people who write about the game 
but who never actually played the game. And I'm not saying you had to play professional ball like Denny did. If you played Pop Warner or anything, you've gotten grabbed in the face mask before. It's not to try and jerk your head off. It's to try to just, I need your, your attention. attention. Yeah. Immediate attention, right? Like, we all have kids. or Well, not Tom, but Tom is already on the right side of this, so he doesn't need to have kids to understand the point. <laughs> like, there's certain times where it's like, hey, man, get down. There's other times where it's like, you know what? I'm not telling you to get down. I am snatching your ass up right now. Because, like, in that moment, I need your attention. It's an attention getter. It's not a... He's not trying to punish the kid by swinging at him. To me, yeah. that's a non-issue. Yeah, and that's the thing, too, because, like, football is a very emotional game. And the player at the time was involved in a fracas, so he's emotional. He's distracted. Quickest way to get his attention, to get him to stop doing the dumb crap he's doing, smack him upside the helmet, which, by the way, he's wearing. It's not like he punched <laughs> a kid in the face. He's wearing a helmet, and it's perfectly acceptable for him to go on that field 60 snaps a game and get hit in the head by somebody who doesn't like him. But it's, oh, if the coach does it, it's a huge deal. Come on. If Washington finishes six, again, like I, I just want to say that I don't think that the incident itself is going to lead to the end of the Jimmy Lake era, but that the results have been, uh, even though he he won the division title last year at three and two, but didn't play for the conference championship because the Pac-12 was strange last season. But Washington is four and five heading into this home game against Arizona State. They have Colorado and Washington State after that. This is probably a six and six team. I don't even know if we can guarantee that, honestly. And and so I'm saying if this is five and seven and you're the Washington administration and you're unhappy with um, hiring decisions, as Bud has mentioned, and the on-field product is, do you think that there's a, a realistic outlook where, again, from a forecasting standpoint, Washington adds uh, its name to these list of changes that we've got coming up in the coaching carousel? I think it's possible. I mean, th- that release that the school sent out was written, uh, looked like by a lawyer. People don't speak like that. That was very mm-hmm. much like we, we were investigating this to find out if, if we can fire this guy for cause. It Ultimately, the decision Washington will have to make is, A, does it want to compete at the highest level? And B, does it feel like it can do so by letting Jimmy Lake retool his staff? Or does it feel like maybe the job is too big for him? And the answers to those questions, and money, obviously, because uh, I don't know if they can afford to buy out if it's not for cause, which if they go for cause on this for this, that, that's that's complete BS. But um, we'll see how committed they are. Is there a clause that says embarrassment to the university? Because, <laughs> I mean, he, he started the week by trashing Oregon's academics, then ended up getting beat, having this be the story. I mean, it's... But it, you it, did... But you did please your boosters by pumping up your academics. So, like, I guess you have oh, yeah, that. Washington, like you, yeah. Yeah, you still, you still lost the game. Do have any of you guys ever met him, talk to Jimmy Lake? No, I just didn't. I mean, I've, I've, I've sat in a meeting with him before, and Ryan Leaf uh, actually, like, went and spent, like, 48 hours with the program. And I remember talking to this about the beginning of the year, like, hey, what type of year do you think it's going to be for Washington? And he he raved about him. He is impressive in person. All, these, I, all this to be said, look. It's only year two, and COVID, they had four games. Remember, they only played four games. Do we ever consider the lack of development that you get and, like, kind of year you lose? Does anybody – and the answer is nobody cares because we've seen coaches fired all around, even last year during that COVID season. See Will Muschamp and others, Gus Malzahn. But, you know, there have been other coaches that have been fired. But what's that? Like, it's just we've lost our minds. The coaching carousel is out uh, it's spinning out of control and it's not going to stop spinning. Uh, I guess ever like it, maybe it just keeps going faster, but it's just, I look at these moves and I'm like, if he gets fired after two years, it has to be like egregiously bad. Like, and I, I, and Bud knows this and you guys do too. I was defensive of Willie Taggart to a fault. And then I talked to some guys that were around him and talked about some of the day-to-day things that were going on. I was like, Oh, if that's the way it was, then yes, that was the way to, that was the right thing to do. I don't know if there's much obvious evidence about Jimmy Lake. Could be wrong, but I'll have to, I'll have to do some digging on that one and find out. Well, as it usually goes, Danny, if there is, we won't hear about it until afterwards. Like five yeah. minutes after he's fired, then all the stuff will come out. <laughs> oh, yes. Well, uh, Danny's through with the coaching carousel, so it's, it's, it's time to get to uh, back to the games on the field. Put our final bow on Week 10 with the pun further review, plus uh, some college football playoff rankings, predictions, and expectations. We'll get into all that and more next. Every member of my family fights this fight. I can't change the way things are done here. 
and your influence within the prisons is unique. He does a lot of good. He will get you killed. The Mayor of Kingstown, streaming November 14th on Paramount+. Plus. Um, upon further review, week 10, uh, what are some of the lingering notes that we've got uh, from the college football weekend? Well, I'll start. Um, I didn't mention this on Saturday night. We ran out of room, but it was just an interesting stat that I saw. It's not even really a stat, just a fun coincidence. I included it in the Monday after, and I wanted to bring it up today. Um, the Atlanta Braves won the World Series this year. Bo Nix was Auburn's starting quarterback. In 1995, the Atlanta Braves won the World Series. Auburn's starting quarterback was Patrick Nix. In 1957, the Milwaukee Braves won the World Series. Auburn's starting quarterback was Lloyd Nix. So if you're an Auburn fan and you want the Braves to win a World Series sooner rather than later, you need to start coaching Bo Nix to not pull out of the pocket too early. Okay. So I, I, I agree with, with, with Tom there that that's, but also like they can't block that. No. I mean, well, okay. They cannot block a really good defensive front. I think Brian Harson and the staff have done a good job creating some points and allowing Bo Nix to look okay. And sometimes even decent against some of the more average defenses they face. But when they play a really good one, uh, they're, they're really just, you know, up creek without a paddle. I'm going to take this to, uh, to Miami where if you look at the final score here, and Georgia Tech plays crazy games seemingly all the time, right? Like they never just have a normal box score. Uh, but this one was was pretty interesting. Uh, Miami had double the success rate that Georgia Tech did. I think it had 300, no, 240 more yards than Georgia Tech did. Really, In about just every way, it dominated this game. But for a couple bounces, they had, a, I think, a tip pass interception that was returned uh, for a touchdown. Like, if you look at moving the ball and stopping the opponent from moving the ball, which are the, are the two things that are most within your control, Miami whipped Georgia Tech. The final scoreboard didn't really reflect that. I don't think we got to that on the Saturday night show, but like the more I looked into this, they crushed them. And uh, Georgia Tech was very fortunate to escape a three-point loss. It, it's, it's so very Miami that when the spotlight is on them, they play poorly. And then as soon as the world kind of moves on and is kind of filing it in, well, Manny Diaz is on the hot seat and going to be fired. We can forget about Miami. They start playing their best football. <laughs> um, I was, I, I know that we did discuss the game uh, a little bit, but because, and, and it's going to hit close to home because it was, you know, my little tagline to start the season and it's gone wrong for me so many times, but is Ohio State's offense as awesome as our video game brains want to make it? Because even as Jackson Smith and Jigba goes for like 240 yards, when you can't turn it into points and when you have been tr having trouble scoring touchdowns against opponents that are not Rutgers, Maryland, and Indiana, I mean, is that something that we play ahead moving forward with Michigan State? Is that something that we play ahead moving forward expecting it against Michigan? Um, I don't I don't know. I like guess that that is one that I had to because I didn't watch hardly any of Ohio State, Nebraska going into Saturday night. I don't think I offered many opinions because I hadn't gotten a chance to dig in. But it is something that has definitely turned me off of Ohio State overs has turned me off of Ohio State team totals. And uh, and I'm I'm thinking that this Ohio State team could show up to the college football playoff and win the national championship, but the inconsistency in performance against quality opponents leads me to believe that there's a floor that's lower than I expected. So one of those things, uh, if you watch a lot of baseball, and uh, Tom, you're a big baseball guy. Dan, you know, you played chip. Uh, you watch some baseball, right? Not, not a huge baseball head. Um, it's an off-season uh, endeavor, and then I'm, I'm amazed at how quickly I just check out about you know late August. So what, what are the things the Astros did, aside from cheating? Uh, when, when, when they when they won their title, is they were one of the lowest strikeout rate teams out there. They were not necessarily the biggest home run hitting team, and they certainly did hit home runs, but they were finding that against better pitching, uh, making contact was actually more valuable in the playoffs than it was potentially in the regular season because the regular season you get a lot of just you know tomatoes you can just hit out of the ballpark, right? In, in the playoffs, you're facing a higher caliber pitching, so you don't. Ohio State does have a thing going on right now to where their performance in some of these big games, it is like 
decreasing in quality more than you think it should relative to how they crush some of these subpar teams. So to me, Ohio State is like a team that does hit home runs a lot, but their strikeouts are just a little bit too much for me to stomach right now. And I need to see them make a little more contact to keep with this baseball analogy before I can really trust them to give Georgia a real threat. But if they make contact, uh, then they're the best offense in the country. And they still might be. They just, It's a little bit kind of boomer bust. Yeah, it, it it's a problem. Like if you look at their red zone touchdown rate, they're above average nationally, but they rank 42nd in the country, which is not where Ohio State should be ranking on offense in any category of importance. But if you look at them on success rate, they rank fourth. And if you look at them points per drive, I think they're top five too. So it's a situation where, yeah, they definitely beat up on the teams they're capable of beating up and they struggle a bit against better teams. But that's the case with every single team in the country this year that's not named Georgia. I mean, Alabama, you could say the same thing about Oklahoma. We could say the same thing about everybody that's competing for a title or we consider a playoff contender is in the same boat. And I'm at least encouraged by the fact that, like I mentioned, success rate. This is a team that does on a down-to-down basis play well. It's struggled a bit in the red zone more than we expect. And I think part of that, honestly, I think is about play calling. I don't think they run okay. the ball enough when they get inside the 20. I think that they're trying to get a little too much passing going. And I think that at times, like with Justin Fields, when you had that dual threat where he could, if it wasn't there, he could take off and get in the end zone and score for you. That helped a lot. They don't really have that with Stroud this year. Well, he's and, also hurt. That's the other point. Yeah. I, I forgot to bring that up. And he hurt his shoulder. There. Sorry. Yeah. But yeah. like, he does not run like a guy who's healthy. And I think they're probably not encouraging him to run a whole lot. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Cause he got, he banged up his shoulder. That's why he missed the Akron game. And I figure that's gotta be part of the coaching is just don't take off and take hits that you don't absolutely need to take. But I just think that when you have Trevion Henderson, you have master T you have Mayan Williams, you have that offensive line. Sometimes when you get inside the 20 or the 10, just maul the team. You're capable of doing it, run the ball down their throat and score. And I think we could we'd stand to see more of that from them in the red zone. Tom said something there that I'm hearing a lot because he said everybody except for Georgia. I feel like Georgia's defense is in a category all by itself, but I still, I don't know about Georgia's offense. And I was looking at their schedule. Like, I think there are quite a few teams that would still be undefeated if they had Georgia's schedule. And I think the the signature win, like it's, it's getting worse and worse to find one. You know, was it Kentucky? It was all it, it is Auburn. It's Auburn for sure, but that win just got a little bit less. You know, if Auburn loses to Alabama, it diminishes it even more. Um, I think it's interesting. I also think, is there any doubt now in any one of your minds that Stetson Bennett is the unquestioned starter and JT Daniels is the backup? Because to me, I think this is as obvious as it gets. I mean, and we maybe we should have just taken it for what it was every time we've seen JT Daniels standing there in his pads on the bench. I think this is his team. And I don't think Kirby Smart is going back unless there's a smash the glass type of situation in a championship game like when Nick Saban went to Tua because Jalen Hurts was not moving anything. Like, I think that's the only situation that you go back to JT Daniels. I think this is Stetson Bennett's team. I will say this, George, like then it kind of comes back to like, okay, do you trust that? I don't know. Like, it, I loved what I saw, the fourth down throw that he – perfectly you know blue like nice touch pass right perfectly through the receiver open beautiful he made some great throws there at different times but again against florida probably one of the better more athletic defenses he faced he did have two interceptions didn't look great in that game like i still i think georgia is in a category just like everybody else which is beatable and maybe some are more beatable and they've been more consistent which they deserve credit but i think they're still gettable danny everybody else is what's happening is everyone else is sinking and everyone is just leaving Georgia up at the top. And Danny is doing a crab in a bucket. He's coming up. He's like, no, Georgia. If all of us are going to start dropping in the eyes of college football everywhere, you don't get to stay above water. You've got your flaws, too. I think game script is so important when it comes to playing Georgia. You have to take a lead. Like yeah. you have yeah. to, you have to game plan the absolute best script that you have for your first possession of the game. And I know that like when it comes to like coin tosses, mathematically and just trend wise, the thing has always been to defer and get the ball the second half. And I get it. Why? But I think that when you're playing Georgia, if you win the coin toss, get the ball, 
put together your best damn drive, your best plays, and go and take a lead and put pressure on them that they have not felt at any point this season. Because I feel like you can't play Georgia from behind. You have to be in front and trying to hold them off offensively. On the Stetson Bennett point, um, I think this really pairs with with what Danny was saying as far as getting a lead because he is typically, and he, I will say he had a good game against Missouri just dropping back. I, I watched the two games I actually watched a lot in that, in that window were Ohio State, Nebraska, and Georgia, Missouri. Um, he actually threw the ball pretty well dropping back. Georgia's run game recently has been sneakily, uh, not poor, uh, slow starting. Mm -hmm. Right. And they are not mauling people from the jump. It really hasn't mattered to Danny's point as well. I mean, if you think about this, could a lot of teams be undefeated with Georgia's schedule? I think so. Yeah. Not a ton, but you know, maybe three or four more. Could a lot of teams blow those opponents out by an average of like three or four scores? No, that, that is the, that that's the part of George, George's resume that really hits home is that they're just dominating everybody, but they're, if you want to find some cracks, you can find some cracks. I don't think they belong in the super team category yet, like we saw with 19 LSU or 20 Bama. I 100% agree with that. Uh, anything else from the notebook before we turn our attention to uh, college football playoff rankings release on Tuesday night with some expectations and maybe even predictions if you got them? So what do we think is going to happen? Michigan State loses. Uh, I don't think Michigan State will fall further than – I think Michigan State will fall behind Cincinnati, but I think that'll do be they, – Do they hold Alabama to the whole same standard they yep. held everybody else, which was yep. you struggle, we're dropping you. But everybody struggled, so nobody will drop. Right. Yeah. And Michigan Bama's State schedule lost. is so much tougher than everybody yeah. else's so far. Yeah, I, I will think say. Like, it's really, really difficult to the schedule. Yeah, I see Michigan State dropping, obviously, because it lost, but I don't see it dropping any further than seven or eight, and I just see everybody kind of moving up a spot. So I'm expecting it to be Georgia, Alabama, Oregon, Ohio State. And Oklahoma still do they fall. Drop... Go ahead. I was going to say, do, do they, they drop play... Michigan State below Michigan? No. No. You they keep stay the head... true to that philosophy. Yeah, you, mm -hmm. stay, you stay to that head-to-head, uh, -head, and I think that because Oklahoma didn't play, it can't. There's no argument to move Oklahoma ahead of Michigan. So it's like Michigan provides the soft landing for Sparty. I do think that they are going to phase out the quote-unquote head-to-head thing uh, because if you watch what whoever the commissioner is who talks now, or AD or whatever his name is, uh, I, I don't know what the guy's name is, but I, I watched Barta. Barta. Gary Barta. There we go. I watched his press conference. He was quick to point out, like, Oregon has the best win, but he wasn't over and over again couching it in the language of, head-to-head -head wins. I think the commit, this committee is setting itself up to lean on the quote-unquote quality wins as opposed to the head-to-head, -head, which we can see you know bear out over the course of the next five rankings. Because, of course, we need six rankings to, 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 you know, to finish out a final uh, one. I don't think it's going to hold forever, though. You know what I mean? I, I don't know that they really can care about head-to-head -head that much over the course of this thing. I can right tell you now, exactly... I can say, tell you where we're going to find out right away. It's with Auburn and Ole Miss because Auburn is six and three. It has wins against Ole Miss, Arkansas, LSU, Georgia State, Akron, Alcorn State. It's got some awesome losses <laughs> Georgia, Texas AM, and Penn State. Uh, strength the record 15, strength the schedule five. Uh, Ole Miss is seven and two. The wins Arkansas, Tennessee, LSU, Louisville, Liberty, Tulane, Austin P. The losses Alabama, Auburn. Awesome losses. Strength of record 12, strength of schedule 11. So head-to-head -head is going to be the only thing, and whether they decide to, because those, to me, look like two very, very close profiles with the exception of um, that one game. It just happens to be won by the team with the worst record. Who who would you put in Auburn Ole Miss if you were ranking them? I would put Ole Miss ahead of Auburn simply because of the losses. And one has fewer losses than the other. <laughs> and I don't think either of them are going to be competing for a playoff spot. So who cares? <laughs> and, and even though the team with even though the team with more losses beat the team with less losses. Like that, this would be the example of where you put it. But that's this the thing. Ohio State, Penn State. Mm -hmm. That's and yeah. I I mean they could do either or, but I feel like once you get to a certain point with the sample sizes, like the head to head matters, but over the larger sample size, Ole Miss has lost fewer games than Auburn. So at some point, how many losses does Auburn need before that head to head no longer counts? And uh, but, but if Auburn swapped out 
I don't know, say Liberty as opposed to playing Penn State, don't you think they'd only have two losses? Like, yes. this is the stupidity of college football. Like, this is what drives me nuts about how stupid this is of what we do. Because it does matter who you play. And they lost to a pretty good Penn State team in a hostile environment. And Ole Miss got to wrap up, rack up a nice win against Liberty at home. I don't know. It, this, it just boggles my mind. Oklahoma's strength of schedule, um, 83. Mm-hmm. That's why you're down there. Uh but behind exactly. all these one loss teams, which will take care of itself in the last. Oh yeah. Because they're playing Oklahoma state and Baylor uh, down the stretch, but it'll still, I mean, Dude. if your non-con games are uh, Missouri state Tulane, and Western Carolina, you know, still a, still a pretty thin, um, still a pretty thin non-conference slate. I am interested to see what happens to Oklahoma. Like by not playing this weekend, did they suddenly improve in the eyes of the committee? Oh, Nebraska is also a part of that. Not there was no Missouri State this year. Uh, Western Carolina was their Missouri State this year. Um, any any other predictions or expectations from Tuesday night? Uh, Do we get UTSA in there finally. Yes, I, Minnesota all the way out of the paint. Hopefully, yes. yeah. yeah Fresno, Fresno State. Hey, now. congrats on the new deal though. PJ Fleck got it just in time. Shoo, just in the nick of time. Get that new seven year deal. UTSA will get that. That you know perfunctory number 25 <laughs> utsa is in i think purdue could be in purdue will be in if yeah, mississippi state's in with three losses last week if minnesota got put in they're gonna put purdue in there's a, so much room for them to give out the honorary 20 to 25 spots because you can throw out mississippi state you can throw out kentucky you can throw out fresno state you can throw out minnesota i mean you've got like four or five spots that are up for grabs for some of those teams that are uh right there in that kind of range so you know if if you're a head coach who gets a uh, a bonus in your contract for finishing in the top 25, well, just get into that 20 through 25 and don't lose the rest of the way, and you you could find yourself uh, being able to cash one of those one of those nice little checks. Um, at six, when what is the Mark Stoops bonus, Bud? It's it's, uh, seven, it's seven wins and ten wins. Okay, so we still need one more win for the greatest contract in all of college sports to uh, to really activate. That, that's including a bowl game, by the way. So there's oh, a pretty good goodness. chance they will get that. Yeah. He's got- and they have Vanderbilt this weekend. So now look, Kentucky has played with its food several times this year. Right. So, I mean, they like the first 10 minutes against ULM. Uh, they were also really close against you central or Western. I, I think it was. And then they didn't play very well against South Carolina. So Kentucky has kind of dared some opponents to beat it so far this year and has played up to some other opponents and we'll see Fandy. if they can get that win at Bandy. Fandy coming off a of bye. Yeah, I'm just saying. Um, we also Look, have if Will Levis plays like he has been playing prior to the Tennessee game, Vandy could beat them. Like anybody could beat them, even like a UMass, if he plays like he had been playing. Either Kentucky comes out mad and good, or we've got a little hangover and a, a chance for our beloved doors. Who uh maybe when we do um bowl no bowl on Wednesday, maybe we can also update some win totals. Uh what is Let's see. Vandy is two and seven. Could that be our third? We need that push. <laughs> Could it be our third for lock in infinity? Uh, we've got some midweek action on the slate Tuesday night. Uh, uh, while we are also discussing our, our good old college football playoff rankings, you got Buffalo, Miami, Akron, Western Michigan, Ohio, Eastern Michigan. Then on Wednesday, three more games, Toledo, Bowling Green, Ball State, NIU, and Kent State, Central Michigan. The whole daggum conference in action on Tuesday and Wednesday. Uh, midweek, Maclocks. Any uh, any leans or best bets for the midweek college football action? I don't like much of anything on the three-game Tuesday night slate, but on Wednesday, I'm eyeing the Ball State Northern Illinois under, and I'm also eyeing Kent State plus two and a half against Central. Tom, what do you make that uh, the uh, Ball State NIU for uh, the total? So that's 60 and a half right now. I had it at 58. Okay. Well, you got at- anything that's got your attention? I'm at 59, so we're only like a point and a half off there. Yeah, uh, so I played Akron plus 27. I also played the under 62 in Akron, Western Michigan. Uh, everybody assumes that that Western Michigan will just go out there and score a million points against Akron, and they may, but I think that assumption is kind of already baked into this line, mm-hmm. uh, and I feel like people are, are like 
guys, I think we are like Vegas already knows Akron's defense is real bad. Like that's not one of these things that will later reveal itself in Mac play. Whereas some things do reveal themselves in Mac play. For instance, uh, I am very close to having a new top team in my tempo ratings. Kent State, now that they're not playing some of these better defenses in the non-con, uh, has steadily been going back to what it was doing, uh, you know, with with its tempo stuff there. So flash uh, fast. I, I, yeah, like I, I made that total this week like 71. So, you know, uh, other things I like this week, I played Toledo. Uh, I've been very good on Bowling Green games this year, both for and against. I think I'm like six and one in those. And I like Toledo here. I think their defense should shut down Bowling Green's offense. And I also like the under at 51 and a half there. And I played Ball State plus three. There you go. All right, give me. Uh, let me get in on that Western Michigan Akron under because uh, an under on CBS Sports Network when it's fifty six degrees and a little bit rainy Michigan is exactly where I want to be uh, in a hoodie and wool socks in my house is the <laughs> uh, the ideal vibes I'm going to be going for. Uh, as of course we also have uh, some CBS Sports HQ and other responsibilities on a very busy Tuesday night in sports. Tuesday night is where you want to be for our college football playoff reactions show. Also on the YouTube channel, uh, we've got lunchtime mailbags. We got Bud Be Bud's bets on Sunday. If you want to get ahead of the market and get some closing line value, that's been very successful for those who have been following. Uh, Wednesday, we'll have a mailbag show, and we'll be back live Thursday, 11 a.m. for our week 11 locks. You can follow him on Twitter at Tom Fernelli. You can follow him at Bud Elliott 3. You can follow me at Chip underscore Patterson. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Aiden O'Connell is the best quarterback in the Big Ten West. Is there any debate? No. <laughs>